Good morning, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to the Mesa City Council study session for the morning of October the 17th. I will note that uh, <coughs> Councilmember Duff is uh, traveling and un unable to attend. We have Vice Mayor Heredia participating via Zoom. Can you hear me, Mr. Vice Mayor? Yes. Great, thank you. All other council members are present. First item on our agenda is to review the agenda we have for our Monday, October 21st regular council meeting. Council, any questions uh, you'd like to, uh, Mr. Brady, is there oh, any staff presentation? Just so, yeah, I, at, uh, whenever you're ready, Mayor, we do have a presentation for items 5A and 5B. 5A and 5B. Council, should we just go to those right now? Can I just make a couple of questions? Of course, Mr. Freeman. So on 6C, I'm still meeting with uh, some of the constituents in the area. That's the um, zoning case uh, 00417. I think we'll have it wrapped up today, Chris, and getting everything resolved there. And it's an introduction. It's an introduction, yes, but still we're, we're working okay. through some of the things there. Good. And then I just want to say 6D, I'm really thankful on the Able Steel Fabricators to allow access from their property over to some state land that kind of traversed through uh, our public safety facility, just a little bit of acreage there, so that allows them to grow and develop with their steel fabrication there. So that turned out really well, so I appreciate all those involved in that. That's, that was a huge win for them. So with that, thank you. I don't have anything else. Great, thank you. Uh, why don't we do the staff presentations and then we'll see what questions remain from council after that. Uh, who'd you like to start with, Mr. Tony, Tony and Scott, or who's coming up? Tony, Deb, okay. <laughs> you don't look so anxious, just. <laughs> All right. Welcome. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and Council. So, Anthony Cadorn, uh, Energy Resources Program Manager, and I'm joined by Deborah Ferraro, who's our Energy Resources Coordinator on the electric supply side. So, we're here to present regarding uh, two items on the agenda, item 5A and 5B. So I'll start out with uh, 5A, which is the Pinal Solar Project uh, with uh, an entity known as the Arizona Electric Power Cooperative, or EPCO. And so this graph shows offers that we've received as a utility to buy renewable power uh, for the utility over the years, starting back in 2011 through today. And you can see back in 2011 timeframe, we were receiving offers in the $60 to $100 per megawatt hour uh, range. And so that, at the time, really was unfeasible as a resource to keep costs manageable for our customers. And so if you kind of look at the bottom of the, these points and where they're falling, you see prices have fallen substantially, down from $60, $70, um, to where through 2017, 2018, we start seeing $40 offers, we start seeing $30 offers, all the way down to the 20s. And so um, some of these projects have been out in the middle of the desert, 400 megawatt projects where there's no way Mesa can accept that power, so we kind of passed on it. But some of them we brought to you before. So we brought the Clean Era project to council. Council approved and authorized the negotiation of that project. But ultimately, changes in um, regulations caused that project to kind of fall apart. And so we're bringing a new project to you today, again with uh, competitive pricing uh, that we hope you'll approve us to move forward with. And so our challenges over the years, we've had three main challenges when it comes to bringing renewable resources to the electric utility. The first is economies of scale. So we're a utility that uses 90 megawatts of power on the hottest day of the hottest year. And so um, with solar projects, you have to start at about 100 megawatts to um, get any good pricing on these projects. It really is difficult to get good pricing if you're building a small project. And so we've taken the approach that we're gonna be an extra 20 megawatts on somebody else's large project. It's been a difficult approach, but we believe it is the winning approach. Um, and so, it, it, but it's been hard to make something work there. Um, in terms of deliverability, again, if it's in the middle of the desert, it's gonna be hard to get the power back to the Rogers substation. So we have received offers for good projects, but. Um, the transmission to get it back to Mesa's utility has been nearly impossible. So we've had to say no to those projects as well. And then long development time. So these projects take two, three years to happen. Regulations can change, costs increase, inflation. 
which we saw with the Clean Air Project. So um, these things stack up against us sometimes to where we may think we have a project on the line and then it just kind of falls apart. But um, the one we're bringing you today, uh, we feel is something that we can make happen and we're excited about it. And that's the uh, EPCO Pinal Solar Project. So it's a very large project, it's 400 megawatts in Pinal County. It's west of Picacho Peak. And we have submitted an indication of interest for 25 megawatts of solar and 20 megawatts of battery storage. And that solar uh, capacity will meet about 21% of our annual energy requirements. So it's, it's a big deal for us. This resource would start on June 1st of 2026. And so it's a pretty quick development timeline for such a big project. And what makes it possible is a program called the New Era Program, our Empowering Rural America. And what that does is uh, aim to reduce carbon for cooperatives across the nation. And it, it's basically a 25% off coupon for solar projects and 10% off coupon for battery storage projects um, for co-ops. And so we're able to uh, take advantage of that program and that was announced for EPCO in September of this year. As far as the progress on the project, they have 100% site control, so they own the land. And we're in discussion with WAP on how to get the power back from ED5 substation <coughs> to Rogers. So that's going to be a little difficult, but um, we started those discussions. They completed their initial study, um, so we're going to be in negotiations with WAP on that. Uh, Western Area Power Administration, thank you. So they're the, the organization that owns the transmission that we get all our power from. So all our power comes across Western power lines. And so the big story I think we're trying to tell today, there's a lot on this graph, but this is uh, Mesa's energy portfolio in past, present, and future. So in the past, we've always brought to you and, and gloated that we have 20% hydropower, 20% um, renewable power. So in 23, 24, if you added up our hydropower plus our customer solar and our downtown solar, we were right at 20% renewable resources. Then last year, thereabouts, um, we signed a deal with Salt River Project for renewable energy. That's going to make up right around 15% of our uh, portfolio. And so you can see that orange slice of conventional resources drops from 80% conventional resources to about 64% renewable resources to where a third of our power next year, next calendar year, is going to be renewable. And then if we look to the future, so adding the EPCO solar project, um, we're actually getting the majority of our power from renewable resources at this point if we're able to do this project. So dropping to 43% renewable or 43% conventional resources and right around 57% renewable resources. So we view that as fairly industry leading um, and we're really hoping that this project takes us to that level. And so what we're seeking on Monday is authorization to negotiate. And so with these deals, um, there's a lot of negotiation involved. There's a series of agreements that we still have to negotiate and sign. The price is going to move a little bit while um, they're developing the project. And so we are seeking authorization to negotiate this with bumpers. So we're setting a price limit. We're setting a term limit. Um, but we'd be working with uh, City of Mesa Legal to negotiate the best deal for our customers. And so next steps, we're going to work on those transmission upgrades and figuring out what it takes to bring power back to Mesa. We'll negotiate the actual agreements. Um, we'll have to fund a little bit of the development costs because there's legal costs and things involved there. And then hopefully negotiate and execute the power purchase agreements to bring this power to our customers and save them money. So any questions? Thank you. I know we have some. Mr. Summers. Uh, so I'm looking at 5B as the item number in the council report on page 4. Sure. And it says the indicative pricing received for the base product is approximately 20% lower than the current base product for April. And then indicative pricing received for the summer peak is 42% lower than the current summer peak product currently under contract. Are you familiar with that? 
Can you expound on that a little bit? What does that mean for potential pricing for customers in the city? Sure. Deb, you want to take that? Sure, that's the next part of our presentation. So if oh, it's well, okay, can I move forward with that and yeah. then answer any yeah, questions let's do that. after? Perfect. Thank you, great. Please. Okay, so uh, in addition to EPCO, we are looking to negotiate some new contracts for our electric power supply. So we had an RFP that went out September 9th, 2024, and we requested various electric power products for different periods of time. So we requested for two years, three years, five years, and then also an open-ended term in case someone could provide pricing for longer than five years or in case someone needed to provide pricing for less than two years. And then that way we could diversify our contracts and not have them all expire at the same time and we could really maximize the benefit and savings for our customers. So there were three different products that we asked for. One is our base supply. So this is our product that is seven days a week and 24 hours a day for the entire year. So we asked for pricing for 15 megawatts. And then we also asked for a summer peak product. So our summer peak product is six days a week, 16 hours a day. And that is for June, July, August, and September. And additionally, we asked for July-August summer peak, and July-August summer peak, seven hours a day, and it's, I'm part of me, it's <laughs> seven days a week and uh, 16 hours a day, and we asked for pricing for either 15 or 25 megawatts. So we received five RFP responses on October 10th, 2024, <coughs> And the new contracts that we're looking to put in place will, ex will replace some expiring contracts. So there are two different expiring contracts. One of them was our summer peak contract, which just expired at the end of September, so a couple weeks ago, and that was 25 megawatts. And then also our base supply contract, we have two of them currently. One of them is set to expire April 2025. So that's a 15 megawatt contract. So we're looking for authorization and approval to move forward with getting best and final pricing so that we could move forward with securing better rates for our customers. So a little bit of uh, history in terms of the different contracts that we've had for electric supply. Uh, in the past, we've had our base supply 15 megawatt, one contract, and then also we had a second base supply that would range between zero and 10 megawatts. We also had a summer peak that was 15 megawatts, and we had a July, August that was 10 megawatts, and then we had this other extra if needed on demand contract, which was based on day ahead market pricing, and that was for 10 megawatts. Moving forward into 2021 and bringing us through to our current contracts, we have for our base supply two. So we have a 15 megawatt and a 10 megawatt, 25 megawatts total base supply all year long energy. It's our 15 megawatt one that is expiring in April of 25 that we're looking to replace through this RFP process. And then we also have a summer peak, which just expired two weeks ago. And that's our 25 megawatt. So moving into the future, we're looking to diversify a little more and stagger the end dates of the contracts. So we are looking at the current 15 megawatt and then a 10 megawatt that expires 1225. And then for our summer peak, a 25 megawatt. And we're also looking at pricing for the super hot days when everyone's running the air conditioning quite a bit, uh, 10 megawatts. So we've received um, pricing for these three different products. So for our summer peak supply, June through September, which we would look to start 2025, June, we have received pricing from four different bidders. And this is going to, again, provide 25 megawatts for those summer months. For our base supply all year long, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, we receive pricing from five bidders, and this is replacing the 15 megawatt base supply that will expire come April, end of April 2025. 
And we also received four from four bidders pricing for that July, August peak. So we don't have a current July, August peak contract, but historically we have, and this will help us diversify and offset the expiration dates further. So based on the lowest indicative pricing received, we do expect to see significant savings from our forecasted budget. So as Councilman Summers had asked, the indicative pricing that we received is um, without giving the exact price, it's between 60 and $70 for our um, 24 hour base, 24 seven days a week. It's between 60 and $70. And historically we were paying an average because there's two base contracts, that average is 7121. So there's some savings there. There's even more savings with the pricing from our summer peaks. So that's June, July, August, September. Historically, um, so it gets delivered to two different delivery points and there's different prices for each delivery point. So the average cost is $169.50 a megawatt hour. And this is what just expired. So the indicative pricing that we received is between 90 and $100 a megawatt hour. So there's going to be significant savings if we move forward with securing that contract as opposed to purchasing power market price. Um, and then as far as our July, August, like I said, we don't have a current project or contract with that, but if we look at the indicative pricing re we received for July, August and compare it to our summer peak. So typically July, August is more expensive than our summer peak. So again, our summer peak average is $169.50 a megawatt hour. For our July, August, we were between $120 and $130 a megawatt hour. So again, about 35, 30 to 45, depending on where we land and depending on best and final pricing that we get, assuming we get the approval to move forward and negotiate. That's, I mean, that's, that's a, a little bit of good news and what's been a really bad couple of years because I've been looking at the inflationary costs of everything from CIP to supplies and in all of our utilities and to have final little bit you know, some price reduction is uh, from good negotiating is uh, fantastic. So, good work. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. And then, no, ladies. Okay. Well, I was just going to ask about that. Is are you? Is it just cost coming down? How how are we negotiating those better prices? What what is the reason for is it is it the type of contracts we're looking at the terms or longer what what do we part of it is timing and then also we've reached out to additional suppliers to ask for bids so we're in the process of trying to become enabled with more power companies so that we can move forward with deals so um, of the pricing that we received, one of them was a company that we hadn't received a bid from before, but also it's just the market. So it's very volatile and this is really good timing as the summer is over to ask for, it doesn't feel like it necessarily, <laughs> <laughs> but to start asking for pricing. So then does that, would that mean you're not, you wouldn't sign a long-term contract then knowing that prices are so volatile like that? What, what is your strategy on that? That's a great qu yeah, question, so council member go yeah. forth. We would um, evaluate based on the different delivery points we have, the total amount of megawatts, and we would likely stagger. So if all of these prices are better than what we had previously, we're only going to be in a better situation, but we're looking at terming them at different lengths okay. so that we can maximize on these savings. And, and I they, think to, to maybe add on to that, you know, the, maybe the question is what's, how do, how do we at Energy Resources know when we're signing a, a good deal and should we sign it long term? And I think we have, how we look at that is that we have budgeted um, supply cost figures going out 10 years or whatever. And that's what we're using along with OMB to set rates for customers over the years. And so when we evaluate these offers, if we see the potential to beat budget by millions of dollars, even if, so say a bid for five years costs more than a bid for three years. So let's say 
you know, we had in the budget a hundred bucks, the bid for five years is $80 and the bid for three years is $75. So if we went with the bid for three years, yeah, we might save customers a little bit more um, over those three years. But in both instances, we're, we're drastically beating the budget to where we know we can reduce rates from our current projections. We may view that longer term deal as more favorable than the three year deal. And we'll use present value analysis to evaluate those things and use an evaluation committee that, that kind of brings in people from all walks of uh, different departments at the city. And so that's kind of how we look at it, is that we have a target long-term to stay within rate competitiveness with SRP. And so if we see long-term deals that will help us achieve that goal, we're gonna tend to lean that way as opposed to going for the short-term deals that are a little less expensive. Yeah, I mean, I imagine you're, you know, you, you do this, you watch the markets and you have that experience with the, um, making sure that whether the short term or the long term deal is is the best at the time. So I, I'm not here to certainly not questioning that, but I'm glad to hear that you certainly keep that in mind. And the goal is to keep rates as low as we can for our customers, for sure. That's funny. These costs are these passed on. Are these part of the commodity costs? So the way that our rates work is that that is just passed on directly to the customer. So it's not really a rate the council approves because it's just what it is. Right. Does that make sense? And so it, it will save the rate payer. I'm gonna make clear that, but it's not necessarily part of the base rates that you will approve. We just pass these costs on direct. Whatever it is, is what it is. It's not driven. For sure, but I mean, it, it matters how well we negotiate, right? Right, that's no, but I'm just saying it. whatever the council approves is not, we don't, that's not baked in, right? Because we, it, it, it gets it added as part of the base rates that we, you approve. I just want to be clear about that part okay. of it. Okay. So it, does, it is a savings, but it's not, it, the way our rates are, it's two parts. It's the base rate that you, we spent a lot of time talking about. It has all the capital and the debt service in it and the labor. And then there's separately the commodity cost gets added to that separately. So it is only, because we don't like, you know, we don't, it's a negotiated rate. It's not, and so it's just passed on to the rate payer. That makes sense. It makes sense. I'm not. I don't think I'm following your distinction, but it certainly makes sense. I mean, I, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I, you know, I like the idea of laddering our contracts for these electrical uh, agreements because we don't, as you pointed out, costs are dropping. You know, throughout the course of the year. Uh, I think, Tony, that as we buy electricity, transmission will be a big deal in getting that electricity here to Mesa. And so having WAPA, you know, do you feel like there's going to be any encumbrances there in getting electricity to our Mesa grid? So I think for this particular solar project, there may be, there, there will be costs, I, I think. Um, just as, just being honest, best evaluation today. WAPA's done the study and, and we think there will be costs now. Where, where are they gonna fall? I think WAPA comes out with a very conservative number. We discuss it, we try and find alternative solutions. And a lot of times those costs are cut drastically. So with the solar deal in particular, I think there will be some. But if, if those overwhelm the economics of the project to where it doesn't make sense now, then we're not on the hook for the project anymore. Um, with regards to transmission in general, uh, we receive all our transmission from WAPA through a service called Network Integrated Transmission Service, which is where we pick points on their network and we say, we're gonna deliver power to Mead substation, to West Wing substation, to Pinnacle Peak, and then they kind of reserve that capacity for us. Okay. And so that's a very economical way to get resources back to Mesa. Um, we haven't seen any real costs that are inordinate coming down the pike. In fact, you know, when I kind of first came into the supply side of the electric utility, we were paying two and a half, two million dollars per year for transmission on a $10 million a year budget. Um, we've since worked to get that down to a million dollars a year. So we, we've actually seen cost savings over the year for transmission. Um, there is the, the potential that if Western needs to upgrade their system for whatever reason, they may send us a bill for that. And I think we, we would fight that pretty hard to make sure that the costs are reasonable and, and Mesa is causing it. So that specter, specter kind of 
hangs over us every year, but for now, transmission costs have been very stable for us and very inexpensive, to be honest. Good. Yeah. I know there's some battery storage developers out there coming online here the next couple, three years, up to 400 megawatt just in battery storage, so might be something we can look to uh, incorporate them in the, in, incorporate them into our portfolio. I think the overarching thing is how can we save monies and pass that on to our customer base. I mean, we don't have a big customer, what, 18 or 19,000 customers, something like that. Kind of small utilities, so whatever we do on the front end affects them on the end of the user, so we have to be very cognizant of that. So I appreciate uh, getting in there and saving monies where we can. Yes, sir. Thanks. Actually, in this, um, and I know he knows this, just 20 megawatts of battery storage. Could you talk a little bit about that? Where's that going to be located uh, and how that works to improve the reliability of the system? Yeah, Mayor, Council Member Summers. So <clears throat> with the, the solar project, the, the battery would actually be located on the same parcel, in, in essence, as the solar. So it's going to be- Now County. Now County, west of Picacho Peak. Um, and so, yeah, that'll be same place as, as the solar panels. As far as how is it, it, it's gonna be used, as far as we understand it, um, right now we actually have Western, WAPA, Western Area Power Administration. They have a 24 hour trading desk and they do all the trading and balancing for our system. So all the day to day, day trading and stuff, they're doing that. Deb and myself are not doing that. And so, sorry. Um, with the battery storage, we would have Western send a schedule on how they want to use the battery tomorrow, and they would send a day ahead schedule. And then uh, the owner and developer of the, the battery and the, uh, the solar next era, they would program the battery to, to act like that, turn on in the late afternoon, turn off later, or charge in the morning, dispatch at night. So it would be a day ahead schedule sent by Western to the, the battery operator every day. So you're saying there's a lot to it. There is, <laughs> yeah. but luckily we're pretty hands off. So. No, it, so this is one of the challenges that we have with uh, re renewable energy, particularly solar, which is abundant here, yep. is you just can't use that at night. So how, how do you adjust it? And I, I was reading an article not uh, maybe a week or so ago uh, that one of the Hawaiian islands had switched over to a huge battery system by a major supplier. Mm -hmm. So now that the solar and the wind that they're generating gets stored and then they use it at night, um, and it's a pretty incredible setup from what I'm, I'm reading. And, and so the opportunity here, particularly with the objectives of moving more of our portfolio into a renewable energy is how do we store that for use at night uh, or for peak times, right? So, uh, and we're starting to see a lot more investment in that area. So this is, this is really uh, really interesting. It leads to some of the larger projects that you that uh, Council Member uh, Freeman was uh, alluding to. So great, I like it. Sure. I can't. Will you remind me what is our target goal for renewable energy? For the Mesa Climate Action Plan, by 2050, it's 100% renewable energy. Oh, so that's what that's what this is working towards, just the 2050 deadline or goal. Okay. Yes, Council Member, go for it. This will oh. get us to 56.8%. Yeah. Yes, sir. In, in 2025. Yeah, a little, maybe probably ahead of schedule. Yeah. And then on the, it, so are we just one um, user of this project? Okay. Councilman, yeah, uh, go forth. Yes. Uh, so we would be, yeah, 25 megawatts out of about 400, and there's, oh, maybe a, a dozen other participants. So how do these agreements work? Do we also have to pay? We're not just a purchaser of the, the energy, right? We enter into, we pay part of the construction, development of the entire project. How does that work? So generally, the, the developer, in this case, it's, it's next era as far as we understand it, they're gonna roll all that cost into their investment. And so that they view that they, they kind of lump all the costs together to build it, to design it, permitting, engineering, and then they're seeking payback through the energy. So okay. so we're truly only paying for that energy as it comes out. Now with, with this one, because it's a public power project um, run by EPCO, so they're organizing all these other subscribers, Mesa and the, the dozen other, they're gonna have legal time <laughs> devoted to it, 
they're going to have administrative staff devoted to it. So they are expecting us to kind of reimburse our portion of their cost to, to help this project along. Um, but other than that, we're not paying uh, any construction costs or anything like that. It's all rolled into the developer's investment and that that's paid back per megawatt hour that the thing produces. So, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, so then how long are we committed to purchase the power from them? This is a 20 year deal. Okay. Yeah. But um, we like this format rather than owning the resource because if it's not producing, they're not getting paid. So they have a huge incentive to make sure this is working every day, every hour. Um, so like for instance, at, at the system outside of uh, Mesa City Plaza, those inverters, uh, it's the same, same structure. So it's a power purchase agreement where we're only paying them for what comes out of it. I think an inverter went down, which is the equipment that supplies the power. It went out like Saturday. They had a crew there that week, I think Wednesday, to replace it. So they, they have people watching these systems every day to make sure they're producing, otherwise they're not getting paid. So we feel it's a good structure. Okay, thank you. Yes. You know, it seems like over the last few years, particularly during COVID, there were some questions, we had questions regarding the profitability of our electric utility. And we were using some of our COVID money to subsidize the electric utility because of the volatility of the market. And so I guess my, my question, that's the context I come into this is, it, I remember the last time we had this discussion, I looked at Mr. Brady and said, Mr. Brady, we need to find innovative ways to, for the electric utility not to lose money for the city of Mesa. So I guess my question is, is that has there been a, a basic, uh, with projects like this coming online, has there been a change in the supply of electricity or is this just a situation where the government's giving us a coupon and we're gonna use that for the next few years uh, and, but, and there hasn't been a, a, a basic you know, change in the supply of electricity that's gonna cause us to be more optimistic about uh, owning an electric utility. And the second part of that question is, in, a, in, in response to the situation I just described, you were coming to us saying, hey, we need to start doing maybe some natural gas generation of our own. Is, does this change any of that? Or, is, or do we want a, a, a portfolio with diverse sources? Mayor, Council, maybe I'll take the second question first and then yeah. we can kind of discuss the first one. So. We are still trying to move forward with the microgrid at PD uh, campus, which is three megawatts. It would make maybe five to 9% of our, our annual power supply. So it's not a huge resource for us, but we, we view it as aspirational. Um, it's a tricky project because the, the cost of it has escalated quite a bit with inflation and, and all those cost pressures. And so trying to make sure that if we do it, we're not costing the, the customers extra money. It, it's, it's on a very fine line right now where if costs go up more, um, then it's not economic for us to do. With a, a low market right now, it's not so economic over the next three to five years, I'd say. Now, things could change very rapidly and in a year we could make all that money back. Um, but you know, aside from all that, um, emissions regulations here in Maricopa County are growing more and more difficult every day. And so gas projects in the county are, are generally growing more difficult. So we're, we're really looking at that project hard to determine if we can do it here. Um, to be honest, we may have to shift gears a little bit and look at a project somewhere else and then bringing the power back to Mesa. So some, a, a different county where the, the generation's not in, in our load pocket. But if we do that, we lose the resiliency benefit of it, right? Because it's, it's no longer here to support us during times of, of outages and things like that. So with that project, we're really looking at it hard, trying to determine if something like that still makes sense. So to be determined there. Um, but we're still interested in gas generation. Um, with regards to profitability of the electric utility, um, I think you know, we take a look at that from time to time to see what's the benefit that the electric utility brings to the city because the electric utility, um, not only do we provide reduced rates to city facilities, so if you took the Mesa Art Center and put it in SRP territory, all of a sudden it's paying more money, right? So we're providing that benefit to the city. 
Um, we're going to be charging a lot of electric vehicles here in our electric service territory. I think we're going to be able to make a rate that saves the city significant amounts of money um, charging those vehicles here versus charging them in SRP or APS or something like that. So, you know, I think we, we try and evaluate that benefit stack for every year. And what I've seen is that the, having an electric utility benefits the city to the tune of maybe six to $8 million per year of benefits to the city savings, general fund transfers, things like that. All the, you add up all the benefits and, and the city's seeing a huge benefit from having an electric utility, which I think other, other cities would be maybe jealous of because we're able to provide that benefit to our own citizens. Um, so, and, and so I, I think in addition to that. Um, so Tony, you, you mentioned that, Mayor, when you talked about the ARPA dollars that we were able to use to provide um, uh, assistance to our ratepayers directly, right? We pay down. That was the result of a huge spike in a supply that was coming out of Texas. It was was it a winter? That was so. That was, was a, that wasn't a Texas thing. That was more of a Southwest so, okay. kind of California thing. Oh, okay, sorry. Texas, California, they're all you know. All so, <laughs> but but the the there was a huge spike. To your point, Mayor, that it was out of control that we didn't ha we didn't have any control on. And so again, it would have been the cost would have been passed on directly to our um, customers in the electric utility. Uh, we were able to use the twenty million, about twenty million dollars in ARPA dollars over. What did that was end up being over two and a half years or so to help really bring down the. the instead of mitigating that cost that was being passed on to us from our suppliers. So that was a conversation we had with council is wanting to diversify, bring some of that um, resource closer to, um, to Mesa that we can control. And I think we're making a big step uh, with that with what we're proposing today. But that's where that came from. I think we continue to explore a variety of options about how to diversify our energy resources. I think this is I was excited to see this, the percentage, how this, this proposal is really um, making a big um, change in our overall, overall portfolio. And we'll continue to explore that as we move towards that um, 100%. But I think um, Tony was saying it right, um, having the electric utility in Mesa, and a lot of people question that, but it, you know, there is a certain level of responsiveness that we can provide to our customers that may not be the same experience you have in other areas, other utilities. I think one, because of our size. Um, but right now, and Tony kind of covered it, um, I, can t we can, I can't remember what the number, I just saw it yesterday, that the number of electric vehicle connections that are gonna be available for, or are now available and will soon be available within the Mesa Electric Utility to serve Mesa v fleet is significant versus the struggle we're still having outside of the Mesa utility with the surrounding utility and trying to get them to provide or provide the uh, power that we need to stand up electric vehicle charging stations in other parts of the city are, are way behind. And so I think we, we can drive that a lot easier when it's our own utility. Um, so there are a lot of benefits. Yeah, I can see obviously our, our electric utility is gonna be responsive to our needs sure. more so than us picking up the phone and trying to uh, hope that we, there's a receptive uh, person on the other side. So I, I'm a, a thousand percent in favor of, of these items moving forward, but I think it, it, we're, there's gonna be a lot of future conversations as we discuss uh, the future of the electric utility and rates, and, and I'm looking forward to those conversations. Just Yes. So when you say a six to eight million dollars, are you talking a net benefit? Is that is that what you're saying? Okay. So it is not costing us more to run it than um, is that what you're saying? I mean, because that's what we started out. Maybe we could further this conversation later. Yeah, well, I'm not sure what the question. To, what you're, you're getting to the basic question of is it a profitable for us yeah, to have this or not? Right. And I think that's so. That's if you look, yeah. Question. And so what first of all, yeah. let's be careful. We don't run it as a profit, right? Right. right? So we just try to cover our costs. Um, we've shown you the rate comparisons with SRP. I think SRP, we're a little ahead of SRP on the residential side or- I think we're still close. behind on both. Yeah, so we're a little behind. I think what we're saying is, but we're very competitive as far as the, what the rate payers are making. But what the electric utility provides for us 
is that as a utility, as the city, we're able to leverage it to do our own solar projects downtown, providing electric um, chargers for our own fleet in downtown. And as the city attorney reminded me, we're much more, as much as we beat up on Tony and his staff, um, when we are working on redevelopment projects in downtown, the, um, we, we, have, we control the utility, right? We have access and we can work with the development to make that work probably in a way that's more responsive than what you see just because of the size of the other utilities around us. It's a unique opportunity and, and the developers will talk about that. Now we have our challenges, but we have having a municipally controlled utility to provide that service is significant. Uh, we think within the core of downtown. And, and the, your point of the goal is not to make money. The goal is to cover costs. And that, I think that's what we're asking. Are mm -hmm. we covering our costs? Oh yeah. Yeah. And, well, and I, I would challenge whether the goal is to make money or not. I think the reason that we have enterprise funds is to make money to contribute back to the general fund. Right. And, and so I, I think that, that this is a, I think we're a little off topic, but I, I think just reminding ourselves, let's get back to this uh, at some point to, uh, to, and to me, that question is always going to be out there is number one, can we justify owning an electric utility? I, obviously there's a lot of advantages to it, but uh, again, I, I think we're, we're a little off of, off of the agenda right now, but let, let's uh, counsel anything else relative to this uh, agenda item for Monday. All right. Ma let, Mayor, I'm just going to add that we, we've owned this utility for over a hundred years. Right. Yeah. That doesn't this mean is, it's still a good idea though. It, it is <laughs> absolutely. A, it's a great idea for our residents and our community here. And I fully support our utility and what it does and leverage. Uh, to provide reliable and affordable power to our customers. That's what we're in the business for. So yeah. with that, thank you. Sorry yeah. to cut in. I, I'm not in favor of selling the electric utility, okay? I, I'm just saying that we need to continually ask ourselves a question. Is this accomplishing the goal for why we own an electric utility? Uh, all right, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank Mr. You. Brady, what else do we have on the agenda for thank as far as staff presentations goes? That's what, that was the only presentation we had available. Okay. Thank you. Council, any other questions regarding Monday's agenda? Mr. Summers. No, que no question, but uh, I would like 6B removed from consent. 6B. Are we doing any presentations on 6A and 6B? Is, that, is there things we need to be talking about or things we need to be Would you, we could do a more quick, aware yeah, of? We can give you a heads up, yeah. I, we, just, I don't know how much has changed from what we did. Yeah, no, about. we needed to make some with the, yes, Mary, come on forward. I mean, with I looked the, at the presentation. As you but. recall, when we came forward with the uh, uh, billboard ordinance, we limited it to two very specific sites. Um, and we are currently in discussions with uh, Maricopa uh, Community Colleges for their specific site. As a result of those conversations and as they brought on a billboard vendor company, um, we've determined that our code needed to be adjusted to accommodate the effective use of the billboard on their property. So let's talk so a little bit. So it, is the landmark one similar or totally different? Like, did we make changes to it? Are you going to talk about both of those then? So Mayor, Council, we can talk about both of them. They are two different ordinances because billboards are have a different purpose than the freeway landmark monuments. You'll remember, um, and I'll just quickly, with the uh, billboards, it was back in March that City Council approved the ordinance to allow billboards um, with certain eligibility requirements that was related to size, it was related to the distance that they had along a freeway. Um, in, in what ended up happening is in applying those um, eligibility criteria, there are two sites in the city that are eligible today. That is the MCC campus and its Fiesta. And we've also included a lot of development standards as it related to the number, the height, the size, spacing, the messaging, et cetera, for the billboards. We did receive our application from MCC and we've been working really closely with them. And what we're looking at is making um, recommendations to city council for three changes related to the development standards. The first development standard that we're making a recommendation to change is the spacing between the billboards. Currently it's 1,200 feet. So if I have a, a site that's 3,000 feet long, I can put two, but they have to be 1,200 feet apart. When we developed this standard, of course, we had done our best practice research and we had seen what other jurisdictions were doing. And 1,200 feet is about a quarter of a mile, which visually we 
wanted to make sure we're not distracting our drivers. So that was our recommendation. When we look at the MCC site and some other sites where this could happen, there are things that happen along a freeway that we uh, probably hadn't taken into account. So for MCC specifically, there's a, an exit ramp. And so what that does is the freeway right away, while the freeway itself is here, the right of way actually extends because of that exit ramp. So what we're, what that does is it push the, pushes the billboard even further back from the freeway. So because the exit ramps have that um, angle that they go, what we are looking to do is recommend that it be a thousand feet between them to allow for those types of conditions. They still would not be able to put more than two on any one site. They still have to meet the size eligibility. They still have to have the front end eligibility. The second spacing requirement, so these are two, two, again, development standards, is that the spacing between the billboard. And what we had looked at was 500 feet, and that was just a, a blanket 500 feet. When we started to look at some of the unique site conditions and if there were intervening <coughs> features that might actually block the billboard from a residential area, we started looking at, well, in this case specifically, some of the residential on the south side of 60 is actually lower than the freeway is and then lower than the MCC site, so in this case in particular. So what we're, we're recommending is to add a line of sight study or a balloon study, which they would put the balloon up to the height of the freeway and make sure from 500 feet that that billboard would not be visible. And so in no case could it be any closer than 400 feet, but that line of sight study would be required. If they can prove that it's still not visible, then that, that could be reduced down to a, a minimum of 400 feet. And then the last air, um, development standard we're looking at changing is the height requirement. The current standard is 48 feet from the grade of the adjacent freeway and not to exceed 70 feet. So again, when we looked at this, we, we looked at it as the freeway and the sites generally at the same elevation. And what we're finding is that's not really what's happening. So we're trying to pull this back in and provide that kind of flexibility and, and efficiency on this. So what we're doing is we're, we're looking to set a 60 foot standard. So no billboard can be over 60 feet tall. And then what we did is we modified how that height is going to be measured. So if you're at or above the grade of the freeway, you would look at the natural average grade 50 feet around the pylon where the billboard would sit and it would be 60 feet from that because we don't want somebody to build a berm and then put it on top of that. And then if you're below the freeway, you would use the elevation of the freeway to, identi to identify what that height is. So it might be higher than 60, the pole itself, but from the freeway, it would never be more than 60. And so those were the three development um, standard um, in a, a application uh, of a specific site that we think will provide some flexibility for the billboards. Okay, so I remember when we had this conversation before that we were told that any like specific billboard would come back to us um, to approve. Is that right? So We'd this is just changing agreement. the amendment, but then the development agreement for the actual billboards would still come back. So, to Mayor us? Count, Council Member Spilsbury, that's correct. They're, they anybody who wants to do a billboard has to do a billboard overlay. Okay. And as part of that process, they also either have to do an, an intergovernmental agreement or a development agreement, both of which will come back. So. City Council will approve the overlay for the billboard and they'll over, they'll approve the IGA or the DA depending on the billboard. But these provisions were in place and applied, I mean, they have to comply, they had to comply with That's these correct. regardless, right? And so we needed, this what's happened now is this site has some unique landscaping grade issues. There's a sound wall on the, it, in, behind, I guess, the homes to the south mm -hmm. on the other side mm -hmm. and the visibility from the back of those yards and from those streets is not you can't be seen but we want to make sure that we have a way to adjust I mean the balloon test is the right way to do it so we're trying to make it work in a context that it's feasible to put a billboard on but at the same protect it from the visuals right. of the residents and things lights like that. lights and all that yeah. so because so I guess what I'm wondering is we came up with a plan, then when we actually got into it, we were like, oh, we have to make these three changes. Mm -hmm. So is the same thing gonna happen when, because Fiesta, it, we don't know what Fiesta's gonna look like, It right? could, it so. could, but it's, the, the nice thing is it's kind of on the same, same alignment. Um, but I think that shows that we're willing to be adaptable because <laughs> you can't just have a blanket template and think 
is going to apply everywhere. Right. And I think we're willing to, we're showing, we're working with MCC to try to meet the spirit of this idea of trying to make it not an intrusion into the, the adjacent neighborhoods, but at the same time make it an effective okay. tool or effective signage that the vendor can actually you know, be able to use. And so but we're trying so to- if, if these are specific to the MCC property, but then maybe they don't work when we down the road with Fiesta, would we then still change the I think we'd have to evaluate that. We haven't gotten that far yet, and that could be I mean, wow. the freeway is crazy, right? Like you're high and then you're low. Right. And then, I mean, it's. And I think that's to, why we're yeah. willing to make the adjustments. Again, we've only, right now, there's only these two, these two sites. Right. So, can I jump in? Yeah. Right? So, why, why tailor or draft an ordinance that's specific to two pieces of property? I mean, we, like you said, we, we, you looked, we determined what the best practice was, and they have to come back anyway. Why can't we do, you know, uh, approve? the variance in this with the specific parcel why draft an ordinance i mean to me i'm uncomfortable with well the ordinance already limits ordinance. it to two sites well but it was a lot more general and it was as as mary just said it was based on best practices for this sort of thing for for the the um, development of a billboard now we're getting into really specific changes that and working with specific parcels and specific landowners. I'm not, I, I don't understand why we would do, I mean, I don't think that's that's our general practice, is it? To write ordinances that, that affect one property or two properties. Well, that's again, we wrote an ordinance, we drafted yeah, exactly. an ordinance exactly. just for two sites, right? So we already did that in the context of approving this ordinance, was specifically made for two sites. So it doesn't apply, we made, we perfectly, we crafted the ordinance so it would only apply to these two sites. Well, the at, at this point in time, there were about five or six sites in the future that it could that it could affect. It, Mayor Council Member, that would be in your, yeah. yeah, that would be for some of the county islands if they were annexed into the but city. But that would the city would have to right. annex in. It'd be a different negotiation. I mean, they don't belong in the city. I mean, there are places today in Southeast Mesa where property owners are reserving before they annex in. They are reserving their land out of the city. To put the billboards on all along Ellsworth Road. I mean, billboards are going up all over there, and we don't have this kind of control. So this is the opportunity where we are trying to accomplish other purposes, right? We're trying to work with MCC to accomplish some larger public policy issues related to education, and we'll probably have the same discussion with Fiesta about the quality of development. So we're using this as a tool to negotiate something. Not just this isn't just about billboards. Right. If anybody thinks this is about billboards, it's not. We wouldn't be doing this. This is about providing a resource for education at MCC. We wouldn't be doing this otherwise. Mm -hmm. for, for Fiesta, it will be a discussion. We've told them the day they come in and talk about the billboards on that side, it will be about us saying, show us quality of development, show us content of development that is important to the city. That will be the reason we will approve the billboards. We're doing this out of the flexibility. We're trying to accommodate this greater good to make it work for MCC to get a, make a billboard that works. Now that they have a vendor on board, they're giving the feedback about what can be effective. And we're trying to balance that out. Now, I don't know if we could effectively push this all into the development agreement, but I don't think we could have amended. I think it's, a, it's just a process issue. I mean, yes, maybe it would be nice Tech, you know, to put it all when we're bringing the development agreement, but I don't think that's the way our code is set up. I think we have to make this change so that when we do the development agreement, um, and that'll, that'll have a lot of discussion about the programming of how the, that. You can't voters. approve a variance within a development agreement. So, so Mayor Council, what we actually wrote into the ordinance that was adopted by the City Council is that you can't modify. So typically if you're modifying the, the development standards, you can do some kind of a PAD. We had written that in just to kind of keep a, it a little bit tighter for protection. Um, I, I would say that I don't think we're easing the regulations at all. In fact, I think the balloon test and the, the line of sight test will actually prove that there won't be visual impacts. Because if you're at the same elevation, you might see the light of a billboard 
more so than if the, the balloon test or the line of sight test shows that it doesn't. Um, the separation between the two, again, you still only are allowed two per acre uh, or per uh, site. You still have to have the same amount of frontage, so we're not increasing the number at all. It's just 200 foot difference between the two. And then the height, again, it just accommodates sites that aren't at the same elevation as the freeway. I understand all that, Mary. My, I have a fundamental problem with drafting an ordinance to benefit two landowners. And I, it, it seemed more general to me the first time. We're picking winners and losers based on what you give and what you get. So I get all, all the changes, I, but um, I'm, I'm not comfortable with doing that, so. Mayor and Council, if I could give context. Um, uh, we, we've drafted a number of ordinances that benefit um, certain properties. Um, uh, the Eastmark development was an entire chapter to the zoning code for uh, property. They were the only ones that used that part of the zoning code until Canaan's came. Those are the only two property owners that have ever used that part of that zoning code. We've made a number of changes to the code because a particular development comes in and we realize that there's a, an issue with, um, uh, with the code. So I can think of other changes in the code and I could give you the examples, but I don't wanna call out the name of the company, but we've changed part of the zoning code. We've charged, changed part of the uh, subdivision code because we've run into issues when a development came in and we realized, wait a second, the code doesn't have certain flexibility and we, we're preventing what we, what we, what we think is a, a, should be allowed, and we need to change the code. And, a, and as far as um, as far as how a variance or other processes, um, so you can't do a var a variance is a very unique term of art, and so you can't do a variance by this way. <clears throat> this is an overlay district to begin with, and so these standards are put into an overlay district, and so every time someone comes in to approve this, they have to get a rezoning from you. So you always have the legislative power to deny the ability for any site to ever receive this. You have many other standards within the zoning code that you're able to, through an overlay zone, to vary. Not a variance, but you're able to vary it. And so many times you'll have other developments come in and you'll vary the development standard for that particular site and that site alone with an overlay zone. This is already, so you have now, this is an overlay zone with standards. We could change the code to add yet another overlay, a PED to a PED to say, you could vary these standards with another overlay. That just, you know, it, or we could change the code to just build in the flexibility to begin with. But the idea that you don't change standards on sites, every time you are adopting a zoning, uh, a zoning case with a PED on it, um, other than this type of PED, you're changing a, un a standard for that site that is unique to that piece of property. So I, hopefully you have that context as far as when you're talking about changing the code for a certain site, you do that with every case where there's a PAD. And just, you know, that's almost, many cities, that's all, that's all the zoning they do is PADs. Every single one of their zoning cases is a PAD because of the power of the PAD within the state statute and the ability to provide unique uh, modifications to a, a unique site. I guess that's what, I mean, why is there not the, the process for this? So we could, we'd have to add yet another, in other words, we already put this in an overlay, right? So this is a PAD. Normally, our other PADs are to vary the standards of the base zone. Right. Well, we, we wanted to make sure that this use, because it's um, a potentially such an intrusive use, we put it in a PAD, and then we put the standards in that PAD. Now, if we want to vary that PAD, we have to have another PAD, you know what I mean? And sometimes you actually see this on some of the cases, PAD, PAD, right? We, we try to clean that up. So instead of doing that, we just said, well, no, we'll just change the base standards, knowing that every single case comes to you for your approval. Every single one's a legislative action. If you don't like the case that comes forward, you can deny it. Regardless, you can say, you know what? I think it should have been 1,200 feet. You, it's a 1,000 feet separation on this one. I'm gonna deny this. I'm gonna deny this, this billboard. As opposed to doing it, the, you know, it's, it gets you to the same place. You still have the legislative control to make the decision. Yeah. I'd like to talk to you further about it, Jim. Okay. Great. Well, and just to piggyback on Jim, I would say, look at the rest of the agenda. Uh, after 6A and 6B, you got 6C, D, and E. These, these are ordinances. 
uh, specific to pieces of property. Every time we have a city council meeting, we pass special ordinances that are specific to a, a particular piece of property, and so they're peculiar. It's not a one-size-fits-all when it comes to land use. We adopt multiple ordinances every meeting that are specifically yeah, tailored is, to that piece of property. This is a broad ordinance, the billboards. It's supposed to cover the entire city. Well, but, no, it, but, it, right? but it doesn't. No. It, 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 we, we crafted it specifically so that it would be only for these two sites. Overlay district. It's like a zoning case, it, and, and, and it's the way I'm seeing it. I mean, it, it, dog leashes, you're right, it's one size fits all. But when you're dealing with land use, and and situations where you're you know changing elevations on a freeway and you can't have a one size you know, to the extent you can you want to have a general sign ordinance right but when it comes to these types of uses and land use it's, I don't think it's offensive at all to say that it's everything's a one off. Interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Let, let's continue to yeah. discuss it. But thank you, Mary. Anything else on that topic? Did you? Did council want a presentation? I don't have freeway landmarks pulled up, but oh. we can answer any specific questions you might have about is freeway Is that 6B landmarks? or is that 6A? Landmark one. Mr. Summers, you're pulling just 6B. Correct, just the, just okay. this one. Then we're good. So you're fine with that covers. All right. Yeah, I'm fine with the other one. Your, is it your district? All right, thank you. I think it's time to start our meeting. Uh, any other discussion about Monday's agenda? All right, thank you. Let's move on then to item 2A, is a presentation and update on Mesa's redevelopment strategy. Council, uh, Jeff McVeigh, manager of Urban Transformation. With me today, we have Jay O'Donnell, our economic development director, Nana Paya, our development services director, and Jeff Robbins, our redevelopment program administrator. This, this group represents the core team of your redevelopment strategy. Um, since council has had approved the additional resources to bring two staff members on to focus on redevelopment in our most recent budget, this core team has been working closely to develop this strategy. Now, we haven't been wasting this time in between either. We are working the ideas of redevelopment. Mr. Robbins is out there knocking on doors, working with developers and property owners already. But in the, in the interim, we wanted to be able to come and give you an overview of, of our strategy. Um, we're here for moral support and ask, answer questions. Mr. Robbins is gonna lead you through the, most of the discussion today. I appreciate the moral support I needed. <laughs> Um, no, Mayor Council, it's great to be with you today. We're excited to talk about Mesa's uh, redevelopment strategy. Uh, the team before you, our purpose is to create momentum for redevelopment opportunities in the city. And while the city has been focusing and doing redevelopment for a very long time, um, we're re-emphasizing uh, the proactive nature of, of this task and going out and then proactively identifying sites, connecting partners to those sites, and then if we're able to generate a project from that effort, facilitating them through the development review process. Um, so why, why redevelopment now? Well, we realize that the amount of greenfield development in the city is shrinking, and this year actually we crossed an important threshold where now less than 10% of Mesa is considered undeveloped. We also know there was a construction boom back in the 1970s and the 1980s in the city, and many of those properties, they are now reaching the end of their useful life, and they may need help um, finding a new vision for, for their sites. And it's not the role of the city to go out and develop those sites ourselves. We're not in that business, but we absolutely can play a role in attracting investment to the city and making it easy to, um, to do business here. There's a number of benefits to redevelopment. First and foremost, it improves the quality of life of our residents, which is why we do most of what we do. It also leverages existing infrastructure. For greenfield projects, we sometimes have to think about how do we extend utilities out to serve certain sites. With redevelopment, most of those utilities, if not all of them, they're already in place. The roads, the water, the sewer. So there is no added, um, or very little, I should say, added public investment to get that site um, renewed. Um, it's already in place. We can tap into all those connections and, and get a second life of the investment we've already put in to our system. 
It increases ec economic activity. Um, it also can support diverse housing. Our balanced housing plan identified the need for more uh, missing middle types, so that's our live work, our duplex, that triplex, townhomes. The sites that we're usually dealing with for the three development, they're often pretty small. And so they're not right for big, long track homes, but they can be great for slotting in a few of these other types of units, which are great for new families that are looking for a place to live or for seniors who might be looking to right-size their housing option. It also supports our MCAP goals. Um, many of the buildings that were developed decades ago are not um, especially efficient when it comes to energy. And so whether we're retrofitting an existing building or we're constructing a new building on an existing site, um, we're creating a more efficient structure um, in our city. And then we want to think about optimal. MCAP is. I'm on acronym for control. Good. All right. Good. Keep us, keep us honest, <laughs> council member. <laughs> uh, Mesa's Climate Action Plan. Thank you. <laughs> um, we, we also think about optimizing the highest and best use of our land. So when we think about Mesa, back in the 1970s, I wasn't here, but I, I've seen maps and I can imagine what it was like. It's a very different city than what we have today. Our needs are different. And so what was constructed on any given site back then, it was great for what the city was then. But Mesa today has different needs. Our communities have different needs. And so being able to look at a site and say, okay, this worked great in 1970, but today, maybe this should be something different, helps us to use that land better and serve the needs of our residents. Um, finally, I'll end with where we started, and that's momentum. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that word a few times today. Creating momentum for the city is so important. And sometimes it's just one keystone project. When that one falls, um, reinvestment is redevelopment, and those dollars are gonna chase each other. And so if we can help to create a situation in, in any part of the city where money's coming in, new buildings are going up, we're renewing old buildings, um, the, the development community knows that, they follow that. They're gonna come and continue to reinvest in those areas. And so part of our team's goal is to go out, start that engine in one place, get it going, go to another, and, and keep that cycle going throughout the city. Um, so we've been doing redevelopment, I mentioned earlier, for a long time, and, and this team, there's a, I, I, I haven't, we haven't actually counted how many years of expertise between us, but I'm gonna say it's a lot. <laughs> and through all the teams that we support, uh, we, we've learned a few things about what works and what the private sector needs from the public sector to be successful. Um, Mesa is a large city, and we, we're proud of the customer service that we provide, but sometimes it's hard to find, especially when time is a factor, the exact right person to ask that question to. So whether it's an individual, whether it's a team, having that single point of contact is great for developers. Um, also, when we start, think of the entitlement assistance that we provide at the city, um, which, is, which is great. Uh, appreciate our DSD team. We can't do what we do in economic development uh, without our DSD partners. All the way from the pre-submittal to the CFO, there's a lot of problem solving. We've got to think through many different challenges on sites. And these sites, when we're talking about redevelopment, they're not usually ideal. You've got some challenge that makes them hard. And so having a code that's flexible, something that allows um, the experts in our, our planning division, in our, our plan review, to, to be creative, to allow for trade-offs, to, to think about the sites, to get them, to get them, get the outcome we want while still making them safe and useful and all the things we need, uh, that is helpful for us. We also, we need infrastructure for these projects. And finally, there's certain things in, we know in our community where it makes sense for the city to take a more proactive hands-on approach. And I'll, you'll, we'll talk about facades in a moment here, but that's an example where we had a public structure that was out in our downtown in front of a private structure and it was creating a challenge. So how can we take a more hands-on approach to resolve that issue so we can allow the private sector to do what it does and, and continue to invest in our community. So I'm gonna walk through, uh, we've had a number of projects uh, in the city, I'll walk through a few of these and, and how we have worked to make these projects successful and how this can help us to be successful in the future. Uh, Venture on Country Club, this was a project where uh, we, we had a conversion of a, um, of a hotel and, and one of the challenges was the parking lot. The parking was designed for hotel use and so staff went out on site and figured out how to retrofit that parking to support this project and we also used the existing building code to make the project happen. OVO, this project has a uh, dedicated project manager from the city, single point of contact like we talked about. It's also on an existing park and ride. So our, our transit team here at the city has been fantastic in, in helping to support us working with Valley Metro and facilitating the project. 
Uh, this is also a project where we're develop, uh, working on a development agreement and a GPLAT lease for the site. A jalapeno Dragon Sonoran Sushi. This one's going to be open soon. I'm excited for it. A great little building built back in the 1960s. I believe, I heard it was supposed to be a bank, and that's a teller window you're seeing there, not a drive through This project could not have happened without using a SKIP, so Substantial Informance Improvement Permit, because if we had to get the entire building up to code today, never would have happened. But because we're able to be flexible where we could be flexible, the project was able to figure out the queuing for what's going to become the drive through for all of the other things that go into a restaurant conversion, hoods and utilities, uh, to make the site feasible. Sorry, Mr. Summers. Thanks. Yes. What is that about the roof? Is that supposed to be screening or? Screening. Yes, it's screening. A rooftop? It didn't Mayor work. Mayor Councilmember Summers, that is screening for the rooftop. For the account. utilities? Okay. It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I could see it. <laughs> so that's just something we have to look at in, in our codes. And it, there's a building, I don't remember which one, but I heard this from a constituent not too long ago that. You know, the, it was a good intent to, to screen the mechanicals, which we would like to do to beautify, but the screening itself seemed worse and, and drew, draws more attention than the mechanicals would have, um, and it created some issues. And I think, like with this one, th that didn't work. So, it, it, looking at these kind of things over time and just. It also, maybe a, be a security barrier. That's why I asked that, Mike, but it's it kind of... I don't know what it was, but it, it, that may be because that, that profile, that roof is so low, they could be concerns about security copper. of the... Cop, the copper theft? Well, yeah. I don't know. I mean, you're right. It's, if it's a screening, it's not effective. It didn't, didn't yeah, it didn't work. It may work. be a security prevention, too. Yeah, so it could be a combination of two things. So if it's if it's a utilitarian use, then it, it uh, certainly met the aesthetics of that, but if it was meant to improve the dynamic. So just as lessons learned as we move forward and how we, how we make the, the, the code effective. But I like, I like the, re uh, the reuse. I think I'm using your mic. Uh, Mayor Council, West Main Station Village. This is a project that's been a long time coming. It's a town on project and, and city staff worked initially to help them get the permits and, and work with the community and some neighborhood outreach. Then there was a, a long pause between phase one and phase two, and so the building permits uh, needed to be renewed. All the plans had, had no longer were up to code, so we had to go through and help them with that. And when that project is currently going through, our system is currently in review. Uh, pit stop to Pedal House. This is a, a great project that I think we're all familiar with. It used to be a gas station, then a car repair. Um, fit a lot of cars on that site, <laughs> on that particular image. And now um, we're able to use the existing building code, form-based code, to, to work through all those, all those challenges of taking a site that you know, wasn't really intended for a restaurant and still making it usable for that, that intent and a, a great, great addition to downtown. Uh, Gus's f famous fried chicken, this, this business went into the old LeBaron building in downtown. Uh, this building had some uh, low-performing uh, retail or vacancies, high vacancy rate. The city saw an opportunity here. This was part of our first facade improvement uh, project. This is how I cut my teeth in economic development uh, years ago. And when Gus's was looking to relocate to, or not relocate, locate a new location of their chain to the Phoenix metro area, they toured downtown. They saw the facade and said, this is exactly on brand for who we are. So that was one of the factors for, for why they came into the downtown. They also received, I want to go back, they also received a sign grant, so that, that cool neon sign there contributes to our, our neon downtown aesthetic. Uh, there's a community ice center near the end of COVID. They came and wanted to take an old paintball stadium and turn it into a, an ice rink, which is a pretty significant amount of uh, adaptive reuse work. And uh, you can imagine the, the capital outlays that are required to make a project like that happen. So uh, development services worked with them to defer and phase the, the um, improvements for their parking lot, which three weeks ago was up on site taking pictures. That's, that's happening right now. Not anything you wanted to add to that project? No, you did good. Okay. Is that behind the blue building? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, 104 West Main, this is another story of, of retail to, to dining. Uh, we have some really fantastic uses in this suite now, but uh, when the building was first bought uh, years ago, there were some mising walls that had been constructed that, that 
work done with a permit, we had to fix that, all the utilities, and this is going to be the future site of a facade improvement, and uh, Outcast has also received a sign grant. Chicanos for the Causa, this project received, uh, there's a lot here, I won't go into all of it, <laughs> but we, we had a DEA that helped to assemble the site, the city owned some land, there was some that was privately held, and, and we helped broker that deal. And then w one of the, the big stories here for this site was that the sewer on Main was at full capacity, and so we, we extended a line down First Street to service it from behind, and that is, uh, that made the project happen. It wouldn't happen without that. There's also been um, significant assistance from um, electric and figuring out how to, how to serve that site. And then finally, the Georgian Superstition Springs. Uh, this is just out east of the main Superstition uh, Mall site. There was an existing Kmart that was there, and the owner wasn't really thinking about redevelopment at the time. And so city staff went out, uh, talked to that owner, helped them think through what that would mean, and then helped broker um, a, a relationship with a developer who's come out, uh, ended up demolishing that site, and has constructed a, a high-end multifamily uh, building there. So, we have a lot of tools. I could have gone on. There's, there's more projects in the city, but um, you get the idea. We've been doing this. We, we have an idea of what works now. But it's time to take those tools and elevate them to a higher strategy um, for the city. And so we have five components to our strategy. The first is site selection, best use analysis, collaboration with private pro uh, partners, marketing and promotion, and then taking all those tools I just talked about and carrying those things forward, the things that we, we know work. Um, for our redevelopment focus, this is, this is important. Now, we, we'd love to be everywhere and have our fingers in every single project, but we, we realize the limits on our capacity, and, and sometimes these projects take years of, of support. So um, it is important for us to, to be smart about where we deploy our, our efforts. And so we, we start by identifying priority areas in the city, then going into those uh, areas, identifying specific sites where we see high redevelopment potential, <coughs> and then conducting a best use analysis to find out what's, what's gonna work on this location. So identify, um, how do we identify priority areas? Uh, there's some of these that are easy because council, you've already helped us by identifying these. The uh, redevelopment areas were designated by council back in 2017 and 2018. We also have the regional centers, especially Fiesta and Superstition Springs. Uh, development services and economic development have been supporting these sites for many years and will continue to support these as they as they can uh, transition and flourish. Then there's other areas in the city where um, we might not have given enough attention. We, we, we maybe have an opportunity there, but we haven't recognized it yet. And so what we're looking for are sites that are near activity centers. So when I say that, I'm talking about generally a major intersection with commercial going around the site. Um, or it can also be, I mentioned before, where there's already investment happening. How can we piggyback on that, help support that investment uh, cascade that's going to happen in any given area? Um, it's not on here, but I should also mention too, the city has done a great job of investing in our community. And there, there are, um, we think of parks, they have value in and of their own but they create a desirable environment around them for more investment. So how can we take those investments the cities already make and leverage additional um, benefit from those? Then we go down into the areas and we start looking at sites. And I'm, I'm gonna, I could have put this one in bold, I probably should have, but willing owner. <laughs> That's usually where the project starts and it's where it may end because we may go out, have the perfect site, the perfect location, but we don't have an owner who's ready to, to reimagine something on that site. And I wanna make uh, clear too, that's not where we walk away though. Uh, one of the things about our team, we have a very uh, long-term mindset. And so maybe that owner, they're not ready quite yet to, to do something with their property, but three years, five years, 10 years out, they might be. And so we are creating a, a tracker that helps us to go down to every single site in the city, see who we've talked with. Um, we maintain that relationship over time. And then when that property is ready for change, we're poised to be able to, to take action, connect them with the right development partners and, and help a great project happen. Uh, land value to improvements. This is a, a great indicator for us when we have improvements that are lower than the value of the land. That's a good indicator for redevelopment. We do track that using uh, GIS assets. 
looking for vacant or relatively vacant properties. Uh, we, we have a data tool that allows us to look at all the leases in the city. We may have, I'll just use an example, a strip center where three of the four suites are vacant and have been vacant for over six months. That owner, if you're that owner, you're thinking, I need to do something different with my property. That could be an adaptive reuse where we go in, we, we think of how to use it differently, or it could be a reinvestment of the property, or maybe it is complete redevelopment. It could be a number of things, but that's another indicator. Utility capacity is critical, especially um, electric, and not just city electric, SRP too. Getting, getting that power out to those sites is, is critical, and it's something that across the industry more and more is becoming a priority for site selection. Um, some uses are going to care a lot about your arterial roads, traffic counts, that's more of your commercial product. Residential doesn't care as much about that. And then, as I mentioned, where can we look at where the city's already made an investment and continue to leverage the benefit from that investment? Uh, finally, we get down to looking at the best uh, use of the site. We are going to look at the city's goals and what's consistent with those goals. So we look at the general plan, fantastic document, that 2050 plan, uh, the zoning, the overlays that may exist, and we, we see what can work. Then we look at what's physically possible. Uh, redevelopment sites, they are, they are often challenging, and we may have 100,000 square feet to work with, but it's, it's all strewn out across a big long line. That's gonna change what can go there. And then finally, what's financially feasible? That's us looking up at the larger market and saying, okay, we have a site that might work for office. It's consistent with the general plan for office, but the market doesn't want office, so we've got to look to something else for that site. Um, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna transition now and, and, and hand it over to Nana to talk a little bit about how we can take some of the strategies that, that we've discussed and put them into use in a, in a real site here in Mesa. Mayor Council, as Jeff um, has been discussing with you, there, there are several projects that have been coming through that when they come in, we look at our zoning code, our general plan, and realize that just strict application of those standards will not be able to help the development move forward. So what we do is we work with the development community or the developer to look at the overall goal and see how we can modify or adjust standards to move the project forward and at the same time achieve the overall goals and visions of the city. So one example that will be coming to you in December is Fiesta. We started working with a developer years ago where we had several meetings with a developer as to what they are trying to do and also looking at our code and standards and coming up with the best way forward. Um, we had to work with them, even with the demolition, as to when they were going to demolish the property and all that. For the past year and a half, we've been having several meetings with the developer and their consulting team to look at ways to move the project forward. We've gone outside our standard practices of meetings where we are dedicating more time and staff to the project because of the significance of the project. So one key part of this project is because they also don't have specific users coming in. As part of our evaluation, we have been looking at making sure the overarching parameters are set, but then when they come in with a specific user, it won't impede the project moving forward. So we have some flexibility for them to be able to market and sort of attract users coming in without having to go through new entitlement processes. So we've been coordinating and collaborating with them. And I know economic development has also been working with them with marketing to attract certain users. So Jay, if you have anything to add. Sure, thanks, Donna. Mayor and Council, we are, um, th this, this particular project, um, I I've been with the city now 15 years and it was on our radar way back then. And so just having the patience to wait and, and kind of see what happens, but also being able to encourage some movement on the site. We did have to wait because there were multiple owners on that site. And I did also want to just mention this particular site is massive in scale. So not all of the redevelopment projects that we're working on will be of, of this size and scope. But this is a really exciting project for us because it allows us to work directly with the developer to really set a vision. And I will tell you, when developers come to us, they always ask, what's the city's vision? What does the city want? Would the city, city support X, Y, Z? So I think it's really good to work 
in tandem um, with council and having this team be on the same page and be um, you know, messaging accordingly is really important. So from a marketing perspective, this adds value to what we're doing and it adds value to the development community as well. Remind me, when is the, this, is, this is coming to city council as far as a, as a zoning case in the next 30 days? Before the end of the year. So what's the timing? It's going to PNZ um, next month? Mayor Council, yes, it's going to PNZ on the 23rd and it's coming to council first week in December. Great. Great, thank you. Please continue. Um, so, Mayor Council, our next steps are to, as we've discussed, identify those priority areas and, and be getting to engage strategic sites. And I think Jeff mentioned at the beginning, we've started that. It's about continuing that work. And um, I've had great experiences so far with this. I, I reached out to one developer, I think it was about three weeks ago, and the first part of the conversation was a little awkward, and I, I couldn't figure out why. And at the end, he said, you know, sorry, I was a little rocky at the beginning. I've never had the city reach out to me to ask how they can help me be successful. This is refreshing. And I've, I've had a similar response from some of the property owners as, wow, I, I, I have been struggling and thank you for reaching out. So I, I think so far uh, the reaction has been great and, and the community is excited for this. Um, we're also gonna continue to build up those relationships with the brokers, uh, developers, architects, all those private partners that we need to be successful in redevelopment so that we know what they're looking for, we know what certain sites need, and we're able to successfully pair projects and, and help projects happen in the city. Um, we're also working, and I should say we, this is really uh, planning is taking the lead on this, but it's a, it's a city-wide effort. Many departments are involved in the infill and adaptive reuse ordinance. And despite the name, it is really an infill adaptive and redevelopment ordinance because so many of the tools that are going to be in this ordinance are gonna be instrumental. In, in helping this team do its job and, and move redevelopment forward. And then um, we, we have our redevelopment area plans. We don't want to forget about those. So our team is looking at how do we build upon all the great projects that have been done to, to get those plans moving? And then how do we accelerate that and, and create more momentum in our redevelopment areas? So with that, Mayor Council, we will um, defer to you for any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Pillsbury. Well, thank you, all of you. You know how excited I am about this. Um, I'm thrilled about it, actually. But I'm also very cognizant of the fact that we have 140 square miles to deal with and that, like you said, you can't be everywhere. So I guess I'm just wondering, I mean, you went through how you identify the priorities and you even said maybe there's like a database or something. So are, is there like a plan to like, pick all the areas in the city and put them in a spreadsheet, a database, and then prioritize them that way. Like, I don't even know how you're figuring out which ones to look at to then identify as a priority. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I'm just worried there's still a lot of areas that are just not even getting looked at. So I have another question, but if you want to answer that one. I'll, I'll, take, a, I'll take a start, and, and this is why we have the, co the whole team here. <laughs> um, Mayor Councilmember Spilsbury, we do have, uh, we do have to build the database. Mr. Robbins is already building a database, and you saw during the presentation some of the things that we're using to help us identify. So the easy one is the redevelopment areas. They, you know, they are council-approved identified area. That's going to be a focus area because we have policy already in place that we can start to implement. But even within those redevelopment areas, there's going to be priority areas within the priority area. Fiesta Mall, you know, light rail corridor. So there are areas where we've already got significant existing public infrastructure and investment that we want to try and reap the benefit from light rail being a, a key one you know um, then outside of our redevelopment areas that's when we start to look at the actual slight selection criteria what about this area makes it one where we should be looking at redevelopment is there already activity that's happening around there that we can then use as a as kind of an incentive to have redevelopment is there challenges is there you know, is there a, a particular corner with a, a retail development that's that's challenged right now that has other attributes that are uh, that are good quality like the traffic counts are good the you know the proximities are good we are going to go through and do all the evaluations of these sites and hopefully be able to come back to you and in and actually in discussion with you as well because we know that that you all have 
areas that you want to see additional efforts in so that we can then take your thoughts in and then apply our criteria to and say, will this actually be, you know, will this be a successful site for us to redevelop? Will this be one where, you know, we reach out to the property owner? Is that property owner going to be willing to work with us? That's, uh, yeah, so we have a lot. We do have quite a bit of way, a ways to go to identify all of the priority areas because it, you're, you're absolutely right. It's too large of a city to think that we can focus on all of it. But there are there are clearly some some attributes of our city and in in specific spots in our city that are going to lend itself more to redevelopment than others. Uh, Mayor Council, if, if I may add to the discussion, so. There are areas that we're going to be very specific, like Jeff's group is going to target. But then the second layer is also the challenges that we've had, why those small areas have not been able to develop. So the infill ordinance, what we're looking at, if you look at our zoning code right now, we have isolated places like the substantial conformance improvement plan, developing, uh, what's it called, DIP. These are all really tools that are geared towards being able to help with redevelopment. But we've realized that when we speak with the development <laughs> community, it's better to really bring it all together in a place that will really facilitate those redevelopment areas. So yes, there are areas where we need to be that proactive. But at the end of the day, we also have to streamline processes. So then the 0.5 acre, one lot, small ones, will be able to go through the processes because we won't be able to have enough staffing to look at every small isolated redevelopment coming into the city. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I very much appreciate that. And I mean, there's just not enough people and time and money and energy to, to go across the whole city. So I guess that's why, like, at the least, I would still like every maybe location to be thrown on a spreadsheet or something. So like, yes, we're aware of this. I mean, I could list 20 off the top of my head in my district. Frankie's telling me they're all in District 3, but um, <laughs> I mean, I, and that's without me just driving around, right? And we get, I mean, I think all of our district coordinators probably have the same thing that happens, but we get calls all the time of frustrated residents that are like, why is the city letting this property look like this? Why is the city letting this building sit there? It looks horrible, right? So I guess, um, it's a huge concern of mine because I have an old, you know, my district's pretty much all built out and so it's just full, especially down Main Street. You know, I was going to mention Main Street. Um, there's, there's some really, really problematic areas. And as you know, as a, as a building sits and then gets graffitied or rocks thrown in the windows or whatever, it just breeds all the other violence that happens and uh, crime and, and stuff we don't want in our neighborhoods, right? And so especially you know where we're powering main area where we're putting some effort in there for our homeless like I, we just we need help in those areas and i don't know that those are in our rdas i don't know that they're council priorities and so i'm going to just keep saying it so that it can keep getting some attention um, my other question i guess is when you're out looking at these properties and stuff our code compliance um, department isn't typically going around trying to find problems they're more responding right so when you guys are out and you see a property that maybe has code complaints, are you referring that to code? Or I'm just struggling a little bit with, um, yeah, properties that just look really bad and are bringing down my neighborhoods in my district. And I just, I'm not sure what angle we want to come at that. Mayor, Councilman Spilsbury, <laughs> uh, we don't have a specific answer as it relates to code, but what I, what, what I can say is that we are lucky that we have a co-compliance director that has a, a fair amount of redevelopment uh, experience in her, in her hip pocket to, that understands, and that we've already started talking with, that she understands that, that part of the redevelopment area plans has a component related to co-compliance, has a components related to whether there's higher instances of crime, graffiti, um, property property quality. So we we do intend to work directly with co-compliance to create specific programs to help us in the implementation of the redevelopment areas. Now, a lot of what you're talking about is outside the redevelopment areas, so we can also then talk about how does and much like what, what we talked about with the infill ordinance, what Nana mentioned, is that that's going to be there to help us where we, where we need to go on the outs, you know, outside of our redevelopment areas. Sam, similarly, whatever program we can develop in, internally for the redevelopment areas related to co-compliance, 
I'm sure will be um, transferable outside of those redevelopment areas. Okay, so I mean, I guess a more direct answer then, do you, do you turn in, for lack of a better word, an issue to code compliance <laughs> if you see it, like you would if you were a neighbor and your neighbor down the road was doing something? Or has we, that just not really come up yet? I, we, I don't, that I hasn't don't. come up yet. But. Okay. Yeah, no, and I mean, code does go out, when they're out there responding to complaints, they okay. also Look around. Do, they do right. around. Uh -huh. And I think we have to be careful, I mean, a home that's just not, or a building that's just not kept up isn't necessarily a code violation. Oh, absolutely, right. right. So, right. Um, but certainly every staff, I mean, I call in issues driving into work. So, I mean, okay. everybody can see something, we can call it in. I mean, okay. I have Andrew two doors down the hall and, <laughs> I, and make it easy. So, yeah, I know every staff has the opportunity. I mean, I think PD provides opportunities. They communicate with code quite a bit and they're out in the streets. They can see that. And oftentimes that is a good deterrence for crime and things like that. So okay. I think every employee, anybody in the city that sees something they think is not, you know, it's not being kept up or not in, uh, consistent, they can call it in and we can okay. check it out. I just know a lot of our efforts in the city are spread to the perimeters, right? The further southeast, northeast, Riverview, now Fiesta. Like, anyway, and so I'm the ugly stepchild in the middle. I get it. So just being an advocate for I my think when you go, I <laughs> district, think, I have to. Yeah, but I think when you see where co-compliance efforts are, it's not on the edges. Well, I'm not talking about oh, oh. compliance. I'm talking about redevelopment, development. Oh, economic sorry, sorry, development. Sorry. Again, where it's, we put it's a lot consistent of with, towards. you know, if council's aware of a development and you want us to reach out and contact them, because the first and foremost, you know, success here is a willing owner, an interested owner, like an owner we can contact. Yeah, right. <laughs> so if you see something, you know, share it with us and we'll, we'll, we'll investigate. Jeff can easily get quickly make contact and see if, there's interest regardless of where it is in the city. Okay, I have lots more to say, but we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks for all the work on this. Thank you. Mr. Summers? Well, I'll use this as an opportunity to remind people we have the Mesa Now app, mm -hmm. so that if you see a code compliance issue or a concern, you can download it, Android, Apple, uh, click on it a few clicks later, and you can report an issue, and staff will get back <coughs> directly to you. As always, you can contact us directly, your, your local council member, and we'll, we'll be happy to share that. Um, I have a question. So uh, before the voters uh, here in just a couple of weeks is the uh, Mesa general plan. We've been doing a lot of that work. Would you describe how this becomes a tool in the toolbox to support what's in that general plan? And what I'm thinking about specifically is that we've changed a little bit of how we do that plan, where instead of this is residential, this is industrial, we use it as a, was it Evolve and a few other things. So I think this kind of fits into an Evolve category. How does that work and how is this a toolbox to support the general plan tool? Um, Councilman Basami, that's, that's a good, well, that was actually why we came up with those place types to look at surrounding and the um, development in, in a comprehensive way. But in addition to this, and I'll defer this to Mary, there is actually a state statute, statute that is going to be coming to you to adopt an ordinance called the Adaptive Reuse Statute, and that will relate to this. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Summers. So when we worked on the general plan, obviously Jeff was a, a big part of that project, and so, because he was working on the RDAs, when we were looking at those evolved areas, we wanted to make sure that they would have that opportunity to um, redevelop. So those areas were identified as evolve, so that we make sure that it is consistent with our general plan. I think it, it, a lot of the areas that we're looking at are in, you know, like along our main street, some of, on the west side of, of, the, of the city. So it will work hand in hand so that we're making sure that those strategies in the general plan are used. I think the infill ordinance that Nana talked about was also one of the things that we identified needed to be done so that, again, we open up this new tool for those smaller lots that can't put in a, a, a garage or all, you know, a, all the landscaping so that we identify what those incentives are for those infill lots. And that's something that we're working on with all of the departments. Yeah. It, it, Sorry, just to follow up. In some of my conversations and about that, 
Um, there were some questions about, well, it seems kind of uh, urban or density rather than suburban. And, but we're out of suburban space. And I think we saw that in the slide here. We're down to 10% green. Was in this presentation 10% green Greenbelt? Yeah. So the idea of, of another East Mark, as an example, that's not happening in Mesa anymore. Now it's about how do we maximize the space we have left for one, and secondly, how do we take a lot of that space that is 30, 40, 50 years old and make it better, maximize its potential, make it places where people want to live, work, play, shop, recreate, learn, all of that. So I'm, I like where we're heading with the, with the redevelopment. I think it's going to be an important support mechanism for the Mesa 2050 plan. Uh, should that be adopted here in three weeks? So I appreciate the work on that. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments, Mr. Freeman? Of course. Thank you. You know, I appreciate this. This has been a long time in coming. You know, Jeff and I have talked about our probably lower performing shopping centers that we've had in our community and our arterial streets and and those you know years ago those were the focus those were our economic drivers and now they're they've really gone downhill and so i really appreciate a team working on this and what i really liked is when nana said we can streamline the processes for this for the landowners and developments because when you talk to them and you talk about the process how they can redevelop or improve their properties we kind of make it easy for them because then they'll go hey, I don't want to do it. You just made it so hard for me. So I think that's really something that we need to talk uh, when you talk to the developers or the property owners. That's important. Uh, yes, thank you for doing this because it'll be a work in process, you know, regardless of the redevelopment areas, but looking at other areas outside of the city and in, in each district, maybe pick cherry pick an area and say, hey, this is an underperforming area. How can I make this area better? And then we create some branding for that area and make it, more uplifting for people that want to live, work, and play. Thanks. Alicia. Um, yeah, thank you. So, I, so Jeff, you'll be the point person on this? Are you kind of the, okay. The many departments involved, but you're going to drive outcomes and, right? Yeah, uh, Mayor, council member, go forth. So yeah, for many, many things I'm the point, but I, I, I do want to say that there's projects where Economic development is absolutely taking the lead, mm -hmm. and when we think about Fiesta, that's not one Alpi is involved in. So, yeah. um, very much a partnership between all of our departments. But for um, the outcomes and metrics, that kind of thing, yeah, that's something that I'll probably be focusing more on okay. and managing. That's helpful. So you said you'll identify priority areas. Do, are we? Are we kind of? Have we decided? You know, our capacity is five each year, I mean, how are we going to determine whether this is a successful program, right? Mm -hmm. how, are we going to, how are we going to measure that? Uh, so, Mayor, Council Member go forth. We, we looked at a few different ways of measuring it, and, and quite honestly, we're still in the middle of this. Jolene's helping us think through this as we go. Um, one of them, I, I keep coming back to the RDAs, it's really easy for us to, to use that polygon and draw that area and try to figure out what's the economic activity that's happening in there. So that's one way of looking at it. We can also look at projects that we directly brought to pass. We can look at CapEx, we can look at number of units, we can look at um, the, the economic impact of any commercial stores that we, that we maybe helped through revitalization of a shopping center, helped, helped bring in. Those are metrics that, that, are, that are pretty trackable. I think this is gonna evolve and it's something that we'll, we'll get better at, at pinning down exactly what this impact is. And then, um, Councilmember, your other question about about capacity. Um, this is something where it's gonna it's gonna vary per project. There are some developments where they they already they're more sophisticated. They understand where they want to go. They may need a little support from us, a little guidance on on this and that. And there's others that they they really need their to have their hands held through the process because it's new to them and and it, the project won't happen without that. So we, that'll be something else that we're evaluating as as we transition out of this ramp up phase where we're trying to identify projects and get things going, there'll be a point where I think we'll willing to pause and say, all right, our, our project load is is significant. How do we how do we manage this better? Or or is this something now where we've got to focus on more the managing rather than trying to seed and create projects. 
That's great. I, I would be interested in seeing what those metrics are as you go along and the goals and how um, the numbers do justify the goals. So that would be great. Yeah, let me, me just say something. One of the reasons we share with council, it's not like we haven't been doing anything, right? Oh, for sure. So we could go back and say, okay, here's what we have been doing. And because I, I think people kind of think, oh, this is a new program. No, we've been doing it. We've put a label on it now. We've added some resources to it. But when you look at, there's some significant projects. I mean, and that sometimes they, we can get them done in a year or two, but you know, the corner of um, Center and Country Club started before I got here, trying to work with property owners. And it's just coming out of the ground. So this is not a flip, this is not a you know, real estate and we flip it type concept. This is not gonna happen, but we, so I think we can we can provide the metrics, but it's there are going to be a whole range of things that are going to some may go faster. I mean, Pebble House still took years, it's still, still waiting for it to open the doors. <laughs> um, but and some are more, you know, Fiesta is going to be declared a success, you know, not when the zoning happens, but when we start seeing development. So that's going to take a decade. So we'll keep trying to bring this up to council, maybe just frequently kind of highlight the projects. You're going to see them, right? Because they're probably going to take your action, right? They're going to take an exception to the zoning. They're going to take requirements of incentives, public utilities, whatever it might be. So we'll, we can probably provide some maybe twice a year updates on kind of what the status is and where things are. But also what Jeff was saying was like this specific kind of outreach does feel different to yes, the owners. That's fair. So that's fair. I yeah. do think, of course, there's been redevelopment happening. Look around the city. but this sort of particular outreach to specific owners across the city is new, and I'm very happy about it. So. And, and if, if I may add, Councilmember go forth, we do, we are building what we are gonna consider to be our metrics of success, success for the redevelopment area. It's not gonna be number of projects completed per year as a, as a, as a target. Um, but I just wanna note that you know, we have had a lot of experience working with this very similar type of focus in the downtown area. And for the first couple, three years, the metric of success is gonna be how many contacts have we made? How many property owners have we found to be interested to work with us? How many starts of discussions are we are gonna have? Because it may be, you know, you know the, the, the 30 year overnight success story of, of downtown that it takes a little while before you start to see the fruits of the effort that is going to, to be the starting point that we are just kicking off now. No, I would agree. And, and as Julie said, um, what you mentioned, Mr. Brady, we've been doing this, but we're, we're clearly um, identifying a new program, right? And in um, setting out this team and putting Jeff in charge, I mean, it's not like business as usual. We, we've certainly acknowledged that we've been doing this, but we're also saying this is a new program. We're gonna go about it a little bit differently. So I think, um, asking for uh, you know, some, so a little bit of metrics on how that new program goes forward, I think is reasonable. So. Uh, Mr. Vice Mayor, uh, would you like to weigh in on this? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, real quick, uh, I think this is a great program. Uh, my, my comment or question, I, I know we, we've discussed uh, adjacent kind of strategies like the retail portion, hiring some consultants to help. Uh, I'm assuming it, it's kind of going to be embedded into this uh, this work that's uh, happening. Um, I know in Fiesta, particularly, we the use of uh, of a third party consultant has helped with us kind of uh, uh, gear conversations with develop with a developer and the the, the landowner there uh, so uh, my hope is that we look at those types of supportive pieces as well to embed even further uh, to kind of move this the this strategy ahead even even faster or just as as uh, as Jeff was saying sometimes you need a handhold uh, some specific uh, owners, uh, or uh, you know, just revision, like revision, the area uh, uh, is going to be an important aspect. And there's experts out there as well that can help us 
kind of uh, uh, move the, the needle in this work. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I think everything, I don't have anything to add. What's, what's been said is, uh, I think, uh, very important. And, and Mesa, as, as we all know, is a, is, is a city that is brand new in places and not brand new in other places. So uh, we need to be good at redevelopment in Mesa, Arizona. And I'm pleased to see the, the, the new emphasis on it, uh, the renewed emphasis. Uh, it, it's fun to see the success in places like downtown, but we need to see that momentum continue in other neighborhoods as well. But thank you very much. This is not an action item, but we appreciate being uh, being updated. Next item on our agenda, item 2B, is to take action on appointments to various boards and committees. Is there a motion to that effect? Thank you, Mr. Summers and Ms. Billsbury. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Mr. Redia, did you vote? <clears throat> yes, aye. Sorry. Okay. No, you're good. Thank you. Any opposed? Thank you. That passes unanimously. Uh, item three on our agenda is to acknowledge receipt of various meeting minutes. Is there a motion to that effect? Thank you, Ms. Spilsbury and Mr. Summers. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Thank you. That passes unanimously. Uh, next is current events and conferences attended. Council members, anything you'd like to share with us? Ms. Spilsbury. Um, so many good things have been happening, and this is the time of year when everything starts happening. So last Thursday at our main library, um, several of us attended the virtual reality open house that they had. Thanks to Meta and then the Mesa Rotary West Club, they have 30 new VR headsets. And it was really fun to listen to a high school and a college student talk about um, how they could use those and in career exploration. Even uh, the Benedictine student talked about you could use them for a meditation session. I just, I don't know, I thought it was so cool. There was, there's a lot more you can do th with these VR sets than just playing games or whatever. So that was great. Um, and then um, a bunch of us also went over to the Heritage Park tree planting that was um, on Thursday. They planted 60 new trees. So I want to thank all of the volunteers and Amazon and Arizona Sustainability Alliance and our amazing departments that all helped with that. That's an area that um, showed economically was, was needing a lot more of these trees over there and didn't have the shade that we have in other parts of the city. So that was exciting. On Monday, I attended a ribbon cutting at the second Laundro Lab in our city. And I think something cool about this, it's not just a... Um, a place to do your laundry, but they also have a lot of resources that they give out to the customers that that um, come there to do their laundry. So I think it's great community resource that we have. Um, they're out on between Power and Sussman on Main Street. And there were so many people there. People are happy to have that out there. Um, I'm wearing purple today. A lot of other people are for National Wear Purple Day um, to raise awareness for domestic violence and to show support to the survivors of domestic violence. And we have tons of resources available listed on our website. And also tonight is our Domestic Violence Awareness Night. Um, and that's always such a beautiful, um, I don't know, I guess we could call it a service program. It's a beautiful program. That'll be out at the Mesa Center City Plaza if people want to attend that. Um, I also wanted to just mention I'm super excited about this. So our Mesa hydration campaign is over officially, but we um, came in with a record number of, I wrote it down, 1,014,160 bottles of water, and our goal was 700,000. So we crushed the record and crushed last year's as well. So just wanted to thank our community, so many businesses and individuals, our chamber, um, really came together to make sure that those the vulnerable in our community had the water that they needed to get through this um, heat. So wanted to thank for that. And then Dia de los Muertos this weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Super excited about that as well. Over at the Mesa Art Center. Thanks. Mr. Summers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, a few things, because we did have a, a week off, but I'll, I'll keep it short. One, uh, this past weekend, we had to Celebrate Mesa event up in Red Mountain, as myself and Councilmember Freeman went and threw t-shirts at people. <laughs> Out at two people, two people. Uh, and so it was a great event, uh, a lot of food trucks, city events. Thank you to everybody that showed up. Uh, I, I 
lost count on how many little yellow hats. I thought firefighter hats were popular to the kids. Those little yellow hats from engineering did a great job. I was a little disappointed. I brought, uh, my in-laws brought both of my grandchildren, one three, one five, and I thought this is gonna be a great way to wear them out. And that three-year-old was chasing goats around the petting zoo, so it didn't work. Uh, I think they were up most of the night. Um, is Scott Butler is in the room. I want to extend my appreciation to uh, Mr. Butler. We took a tour of the uh, Superstition uh, Police Precinct and the attached fire station that was out there because uh, there's, uh, there's some concerns with the building. It's, it was built in 97. It's uh, speaking of buildings that are getting a little long in the tooth and beyond their useful life. I don't think that's that building's beyond its useful life, but it definitely needs some upgrades uh, to it. And Scott was kind enough to go out and kind of take a look to see what we might be able to do. I think we're going to be having some future conversations, you know, not in near term, but longer term about how we improve some of our existing infrastructure. A lot of our bonds are about growth. Well, as we grow out, it's about time we start to look at some of our older, uh, older facilities, and particularly when it comes to our police officers and firefighters who practically live in those buildings, it'd be nice that we make sure that um, they're up to date uh, for them and in, in decent shape. Um, on a personal note, if I may, um, oh wait, one more, um, and that was for uh, Jay O'Donnell. Did a great job with uh, Sally Jo Harrison over at the chamber of the Southeast Mesa annual bus tour for economic development. We, have, we still have a lot of property and opportunity um, out in that area for growth. And the focus this time was looking at uh, both the existing spec development and uh, vacant land for how do we really maximize this land for jobs, putting new jobs, new opportunities in there because the, we, we spoke about the East Mark Cadence Plan and, and Gateway Strategic Development Plan. It was very much about creating a live, work, play, shop, educate environment. And uh, one of the things that we really need to focus back on is 100,000 high wage jobs. That was our, we should call them high value jobs. That was the focus then and needs to be in the future. So we, uh, they did an absolutely fantastic job of doing that. I had the opportunity just to stop in last minute uh, and thank everybody for their participation. Um, I've missed a few events this week. I apologize for that. The Phoenix Fire Department, which I was a member of for nearly 30 years, um, has hit some tragedy over the past few weeks. We've lost uh, two firefighters in job-related incidents. Uh, and I was in attendance at those funerals, and one, uh, John Thomason, uh, we buried yesterday. Uh, and he sat right here next to me uh, for years uh, at Fire Station 19. Um, I bring this up because it goes to the sacrifice uh, that particularly our police officers and firefighters, but others in the city uh, put themselves in line. Um, and so things like making sure their stations are up to date, uh, making sure they're well compensated um, is important to the city because they're there for us and we need to be there for them. I'm the only one that doesn't uh, break down and I just ruined that, uh, ruined that one. Oh, welcome to the club, what, well deserved. Thank you. No, well, I was out of town, so. Well, well thank you, uh, Scott, for that. Uh, memory of your firefighter, fellow firefighter. I know what it feels like. Uh, with that said, this past week, I was able to attend a tour with our solid waste and environmental directors over at SRP at their recycling facility. I think I found, they found that very informational and you know, potential partnerships that we can have with the city, with other entities so that we can be more cognizant of opportunities for a climate action plan and compliant with our environment environment so it turned out really well and appreciated going with them also i'd like to invite uh, chief camelli to come up and give us an announcement if you would the fire trucks are going to be red <laughs> no we're getting, we're getting another electric fire truck no, just kidding <laughs> 
I think you have something to say about Chief Johnson. I do, I do. Uh, Mayor Giles, Councilmember Freeman, members of the council. Uh, first, uh, Councilmember Summers, our thoughts and prayers are with our brothers and sisters in Phoenix, and we've let them know that as well. It is a sad time. Uh, I do want to say on a, I guess it's a bittersweet note, um, Assistant Chief James Johnson, today is his last day of work after 30 years of service to the city of Mesa. And I want to say that I've known Chief Johnson for 30 years, and he has given his very best every single time he's been to work when he's serving the community and serving the public. This is a man of honesty, integrity, that he lives every day. We are going to miss him. I'm excited for him to move forward, but he truly has been an integral part of our team, I've been a part of senior staff for 10 years. Uh, but James is a man you could tell something in confidence and you know is staying in confidence. Anybody who knows James Johnson knows that of James. And it's a privilege and honor for me to have worked with him for so long, but I think we're losing a great employee, uh, but his family's gonna get him back and he's gonna love that. Uh, also, one other thing about Chief Johnson, he was just inducted a few months ago into his school hall of fame for the things that he does outside of work as well, for what he does here, but what he does for others outside of work. He's been a coach for many years, but um, we're going to miss James, but I thank you for this opportunity for me to brag about him and let you know a little bit about Chief Johnson as we know Chief Johnson. So uh, congratulations for James. Chief, any last words? Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. This is your opportunity. Oh, thank you. And thanks to Chief Camelli. She's a very special person. You guys all know that. Um, Thanks for the words, and, and I just want to say thank you to the city, and, and please know that you guys do support us, Mr. Brady, all the way, everybody, and our equipment is second to none. Um, the cancer stuff you do for us, it's very appreciated, and we have the best city and the best fire department around, and, and I knew that from day one, but the 30 years of going around to different conferences and, and everything that we do, um, Chief knows this even more than I do. It, we have the best. And, and that's the thank you to everybody here, um, the whole city. So uh, that's it before I start crying too much. <laughs> thank you. Well, we can say thank you for your service. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chief Johnson, you, you really uh, have been a, an, an enormous part of making our fire department such a special place, so thank you for your amazing service. Uh, that, um, let's see, before we move on, I just want to acknowledge, we've had some special uh, visitors with us during this meeting that I want to acknowledge. Uh, we, as you know, I think everyone knows, one of our, uh, we have a sister city in Guaymas, San Carlos, Mexico, and we, we love that relationship. It's, it's one that goes back decades, and it's been a very close and very uh, rewarding relationship, I think, for both Guaymas and for the city of Mesa. So we're honored to have with us today Mayor Carla Cordova and a delegation from Guaymas. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Again, uh, I know part of the timing of this delegation is uh, the fact that we're celebrating our Dia de los Muertos festival this weekend. I know that was mentioned, but uh, hopefully everyone in the sound of my voice uh, has attended or is planning on attending the Dia de los Muertos festival. If you live in Mesa and you haven't been, that's a shame because it's really one of the one of the best things that we've done. Uh, we received national awards for for that festival uh, at, at the Mesa Art Center this weekend, Saturday and Sunday. The procession on Sunday is particularly something that you don't want to miss. So uh, thank you to, to Wymus for coming uh, up to Mesa to help us celebrate that. Uh, speaking of our fire department, we have a, a tradition where we uh, have, have, over the years, uh, shared some equipment with, with Wymus for, for uh, public safety. And, and I'm very pleased that uh, I want to thank Mesa Fire and Medical for identifying some items that, that they are uh, able to contribute to the Wymus Fire Team, and we're looking forward to making that happen. So please join me in giving a welcome to our friends from Wymus. <laughs> and we'll have a few receptions and, and uh, spend some more time with them one-on-one -on -one, uh, before they, they leave at the end of the weekend. Uh, Mr. Brady, what is our schedule of future meetings look like? Uh, just a reminder, we have a next council meeting will be on Monday, October 21st. And we'll have our study session beginning at 515. Speaking of the Mace Arts Center, the uh, Mace Arts Center has been recognized as the best performing art center in the Phoenix New Times Best of Phoenix Reader's Choice issue for 2024. So congratulations to the staff at the Mace Arts Center. Thank you. Great. Thank you. 
That concludes uh, everything on our agenda. Is our motion to adjourn? Thank you, Mr. Summers. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. We are adjourned.